Matt Thornton. MMA coach, is it the correct description? Uh, that's part of what we do. I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. We have a mixed martial arts team, yeah. Um, major concept in uh, straight blast gym is aliveness. Can you explain that? It's uh, aliveness is timing, energy, and motion. So we want to make sure that something has timing. It's not predictable. It's not in a pattern. It has movement, so it's not static. And it's uh, there's resistance. By energy, we mean resistance, so it's not compliant. So if you have something that's compliant, static, and in a pattern, then what you're doing is not alive. Why do people train like that these days? Uh, I think people train that way these days just because that's how they were taught. Um, and it's just a really bad training method that's propagated itself um, through the culture. But it, they don't. People do lots of things that are silly that uh, aren't functional. So, and, and traditional martial arts is just one of those, one of many things like that. Do you think people have a need to follow authorities? Like uh, sure, some people do. I mean, I think that the, you can draw a direct correlation between. Traditional martial arts and religion, as an example, we have gurus and senseis, and usually a creation myth about how the whole thing started. A rigid set of dogma. In this case, it's techniques that are, is unchanging. They value how long it's gone unchanged, which, if you think about it, is really backwards in any other field, whether it's science or uh, medicine or anything else. Uh, I think you, you wouldn't go to a doctor who practiced like uh, 17th century. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, it's same thing with traditional martial arts, very much like religion that way or superstition. So you mean aliveness is applic applicable to other parts of life and so on? I do. I see a direct co uh, correlation to aliveness and science as an example. Because in science you have uh, an, an objective question and you're looking for an empirical answer to the objective question, and you have a way of testing it uh, through experiments and uh, peer review, and you have a process of competition that the idea has to go through. And if it survives that competition, then it can be viewed uh, as a potential answer. It's a, it's a way to find answers to objective questions. And what we do is the same thing applied to combat. We have an objective question, does this work? And we have ways to test it. Um, it's peer review, people all over the world test it, people all over the world do it. It's just not one person that's able to do these moves, but, you know, thousands and thousands of people, and so it's very similar. Uh, maybe a personal question, but the text on your arms, oh, what's that? Uh, it's text from an Indian poet I'm fond of, actually. And uh, who is that? Or that? Uh, uh, Ramana. Okay. Yeah. And what uh, do you like about uh, him? Uh... I spent probably 15 years studying of my own uh, interest, Eastern religion and mysticism. And I think that most of it, probably 95% of it, if not more, just like 95% of the New Age movement is just ridiculous, hocus-pocus, cultural superstition. But within that, you you will find um, some good things, some tru truisms. I mean, obviously there's some... There's some value and some psychological truths that you can find in Buddhism, as an example, if you separate all the cultural superstition that's attached to it. So, uh, Ramana is just one of the one of the few of the older uh, uh, Indian teachers that I think you know did that pretty well. Uh, you can say that you think that all religions have common standpoints, like uh, uh, Joseph Campbell. Yes, it's true. It doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that I think the underlying narrative for all of them is the same. Which was Joseph Campbell's idea was that at the heart of all the different religions, they essentially tell the same story. That may or may not be true. You have to ask yourself if if you're the one that's putting forward that proposition. You have to ask yourself if if you're reading that into it. You can read a lot of different uh, meanings into given metaphors. And different people will read this, the same book in many different ways. So sometimes that's more the interpretation of the scholar than it is, you know, it's hard to predict, for example, what the author of a book written in the Bronze Age actually meant. Did he mean it literally? Was it a metaphor? You know, if you're not that author, and, and there's, there's not a lot of other work around it to explain, who are we to say that it was? Who am I to say that uh, Garden of Eden was meant as a metaphor? 
it could have very well been uh, an early man's attempt to explain creation, the creation of human beings before they had any true answers. Maybe it was meant as a metaphor, maybe it wasn't. So, But either way, you can read it as a metaphor now, 2010, if you're educated and you understand it, and you can read into that story many different interpretations. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that that's the right interpretation or what the original authors of that particular story meant. So that's, that's what I think about that. Okay.